to abolish pet ownership. An outrageous thought, right? But maybe not. One writer's view that pet ownership is pure domination and evil. Next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights. Brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, pet ownership. Is it enough to call them our animal companions and say all is good? Or does a true animal lover dare to think the blasphemous? that maybe owning a pet is really a relationship of domination and control. And if it is, is that proper? Troy Vitesi is a postdoctoral scholar whose essay in The Guardian caused quite a stir this year. He actually believes that with spaying and neutering, the end of puppy mills, the end of manipulative doodle-dog breeds, and the return to appreciating animals in their natural habitats, as in birding. With all that, Vitesi feels that we could end all pet ownership in 20 years. Vitesi says it's good for the animals, good for the world, and good for animal rights. But is he serious? Or simply being provocative and challenging? You be the judge. My conversation with writer-author Troy Vitesi on The PETA Podcast. I guess you want to be the heretic, huh? And say that <laughs> being a pet owner is bad. That's that's really the message. It's not as good as people think, right? I'm I'm not trying to find the world's most unpopular position, but uh, I think it, it it comes that way. I mean, I wrote a book on vegan communism, which is like the most niche political position you could imagine. I mean, like, yeah, you have a communist movement, it's very tiny, and then finding the very few communists who actually care about animals, which is a very small number, because most people on the left, they got on the socialist left, they do not care about animals. And uh, I wrote a book on that, which, you know, it's not been very popular. I mean, I mean, some people, some people like it, I'm happy people like it, but a lot of people on the left do not like it. And it's a small group of people who really think you need socialism and you need animal rights. And, uh, and then I wrote this animal, you know, this pet thing, uh, this pet op-ed. And I really wrote it because, you know, I, I think for a while I felt pet ownership was, was strange, uh, and, you know, over the years. But it, it really sharpened, or the importance of it, or the, like, my critique of it sharpened when I became a bird watcher. Because suddenly... I could see like the damage that pets were doing to other animals. And then also, I, I, and I also liked the relationship I was cultivating with wild animals as in I wasn't imposing myself on wild animals. Like they were free, they could do what they want and I could learn about them and enjoy them and find them beautiful and all that versus a, a pet relationship where it's really, it's really selfish in yeah. many ways. And this is, you know, I can, I can hedge what I'm saying where if you're, you know, a vegan, you feed your pet vegan, a pet food, it's a shelter animal, you know, it, your pet doesn't kill other animals. I think that's that's not a bad thing. There's obviously, lots of pets are killed every year in shelters and, and all that. But I think the end goal should be a society without pets, which is not a popular opinion. I, to go back to the whole niche communism uh, idea, you, what you're saying there is that it's not just animal rights, but you're saying you're looking at all beings as being equal, right? Well, the idea is, you know, we live in a capitalist society and capitalism is destroying the world. And whenever someone's going to tell you, oh, we'll have a market-based solution for the environmental crisis, like to save an endangered species or to stop global warming and all that. I mean, this is all nonsense. Like, no- nothing is working. We need more radical changes. And the- it's not working because capitalism is dependent on finding ever more things to commodify it and feed it into the maw of, of factory farms and to real estate uh, speculation or whatever it is. And you need to put real barriers to that growth, right? You need to stop that growth if you want to leave space for other animals. And we have to do that, you know, in some ways for in self for selfish reasons, as in like we need to have a, a, a biosphere that works. And the Anthropocene is a concept saying that the Earth system 
is out of whack and is really destabilized. And it's not just about fossil fuel emissions. It's actually mostly about factory farming and the destruction to the biosphere and, uh, and overfishing and all that. If you actually read the scientific papers, it's mostly about what we eat and how that's destroying the world. Right. So we can do that for selfish reasons, as in if you, if you treat you know, the, the rest of the world and the rest of creation better, then it's better for us. But I think there's also many reasons to support animal rights if you care. I mean, if, you, if you're on the left, regardless. I mean, if you're on the left, you should care about oppression you should you should want the liberation for for people, but also for the the rest of the world. If once socialists start using arguments to justify meat consumption or, or whatever it is, they have they start sounding like conservatives, right? Right. They right. have to appeal to tradition or some kind of pseudoscience, and uh, they have to say that violence is good or might makes right, or they they sound like reactionaries. And I think if you're a real lefty, you should apply your your uh, lens. In your desire for uh, for liberation and freedom to 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 as many beings as possible, right? And I, I guess what really uh, strikes me is that you hit the core of uh, the problem, which is, or what some people see as the answer, that animal rights is okay, or like artificial meat is okay if it makes money for somebody. The answer is in some kind of capitalistic uh, enterprise. That make that justifies our values. It's just it's just not going to happen. I can say even if you get lab meat, it's going to be like ten percent of the market, and a lot of people are going to be like, "Oh, but it's a little more expensive, or it doesn't taste the same." Or, yeah. You know, people eat meat because they're trying to signify uh, their their gender position, like it's a macho thing and all that, and then their class position. Like it's an example of waste, right? If you read your Veblen, people <laughs> waste resources yeah. to show their their status and that, that's the thing people are doing and it's not just about taste people don't eat meat for taste and i think it was so when people are really into lab meat i think that's going to solve everything it's not i mean we need to have like a political fight to ban meat consumption and i think the lab meat crowd they are trying to avoid conflict like, and i'm sorry i mean the, the crisis is really bad and we need to take rapid action now but you're not going to avoid conflict yeah so all right so that's the general that was your first book that was unpopular or (laughs) (laughs) where you took a a stand against capitalism now uh it you can see where it naturally leads into your stand on pet pet ownership and how bad pet ownership is and um and you you mentioned that you know bird watching where you can appreciate the wildlife, you can appreciate the animal and the animal's free. Yes. And I think, um, and there's really good studies uh, on this. There's a book by Elizabeth Cherry on, uh, eth- an, it's an ethnography of bird watchers. And it's quite nice where it's, she says that bird watching teaches uh, birders to cultivate this ecological gaze. Like once you start birding, you start thinking, hey, where is this bird going? What is it eating? What are the threats to it? What you know, ecosystems does it like? You know, I should protect this wetland because I like this bird, and and you see all these these connections that I think you can't see. You know, if you just have a, a pet, and I think I mean, there's many problems with with pet ownership, which I'm sure we're going to get into. But I think it, um, and I say in the piece that there's like three main problems: one that it's bad for pets themselves, one that it's bad for other animals. And I think uh, probably most you know, severely in some ways and most insidiously is that it's bad for, bad for pet owners because it, um, pet owners then uh, see the natural world differently. They see other animals differently. So like animals should exist if they're cute, if they're harmless, if they are you know, paying attention to you and making you happy. Otherwise, you're not really interested in, in other animals. And I think that's the, the complete opposite of this like, naturalist gaze that uh, birders cultivate. And uh, I'm afraid we're looking for like a good domination of nature, right? Like acute domination of nature, rather than realizing we have to uh, try to liberate nature and give space for nature and to um, you know, find nature sublime and beautiful, but also give it space to uh, actually function uh, properly because we, we depend on it. But it's also an amazing, an amazing thing. And that, that all that sublime um, 
you know, beauty of nature is lost if you're looking for this safe, cute relationship. Yeah. And, and so in, in many ways, the ideal form of pet ownership should be birding. That, 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 should, mean, that should be the condition of one's relationship. It should be the nature of uh, a birder to the bird. I think birding is one way. I think there are many other ways we could relate to nature. You know, again, I, I'm a historian, I'm an environmental historian. I also work quite a bit in animal studies. And I find it strange that there's so many books and studies written in this Donna Haraway vein about, you know, companion species and people who have, uh, you know, horses and dogs and whatever. And, but there's really nothing on wildlife rehabilitators, right? And I think that is actually a very beautiful relationship. Like, you know, we have messed up the world. We have made the world a, a terrible place for you know, billions of creatures, let alone billions of fellow humans. And there's a very small group of people who are not getting any funding from the government or anything like that, or big organizations. They're often, you know, they're volunteers who are trying to help injured wild animals, mm -hmm. right? And uh, there actually was a, a film that was nominated for an Oscar recently by uh, called All That Breathed. It's about these two Indian brothers who are uh, engaged in rehabilitating uh, wild wild birds, and I think you know that's that's a relationship where you know we can connect with other animals, but we're doing it unselfishly, you know, like to really be un un unselfish finally with with our relationship, and that's 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 one way we can do it uh, as well. But I think there, we should be cultivating these other kinds of relationships with with, with animals. All right, so th that is the ideal. That, that's where we should be going. But unfortunately, where we are is in this $260 billion global pet market that you're talking about. That we're, we're, we're mired in this, um, this, this pet, pet idea that is, really feeds into the capitalist structure of the way things are. I mean, uh, it's, it's a market. Uh, you point out that the $260 billion global pet market is greater than the solar and wind industries combined. It's massive. This is, we, we have created this. And you, you, you even mentioned China going from zero pets to 251 million. It's, it's also weird that we see there's this relationship between capitalism and this, this pet relationship. Like it doesn't exist in, in other societies, right? I mean, people would have, let's say a hunting dog, you know, that they liked or whatever it was, or maybe like a, they were a shepherd with a, like a sheep dog or whatever, but the, the pets were working in right. some, yeah. maybe the animals were working. And, and then this idea of having an animal that is useless. So, I mean, by definition, that's kind of what a pet is, a pet that doesn't do any work, that is only providing like emotional comfort to its owner. That only emerges with the onset of capitalism. It emerges first in Britain in the 19th century, and then you get the first dog shows, first like pet food for dogs. And that was the first breeding, like really intensive breeding of, of animals in the late 19th century in England. Because before that, there wasn't, there weren't that many breeds and they weren't very strictly enforced. And suddenly people are really uh, breeding animals to be in another kind of commodity. And that's terrible uh, for the animals, but also is something that can only really happen in a, in a capitalist uh, society. And again, as capitalism spreads, uh, you know, people become very unhappy in a capitalist society. People are, don't feel fulfilled. They feel alienated from uh, from their work. They feel, you know, anomi from uh, the other people in society. And because they're sad, they, they buy an animal for emotional support. And I think we should not be at some of outsourcing the emotional problems that we have caused, you know, to other other people to animals because animals do suffer as pets. And I think people don't really like talking about it, but you know, people don't uh, spend enough time with their pets. They don't walk their dogs enough or, uh, or whatever it is. I know definitely uh, pet uh, birds suffer a huge amount. They're extremely social animals. And if you only hang out with them a couple hours a day, that that's not good enough. That's the, the, the real issue behind this idea that I would call heresy in our society that, you know, pet ownership is bad. And the point is, it is bad because animals are suffering. Animals suffer as pets, which some people say, now that's not true. I, I uh, you know, walk my dog, I feed the dog, and I, I found this dog, I rescued it. How, how, are, how are animals suffering as pets? 
you know, I wrote this op-ed and I've written plenty of things over the years. And this got like a huge um, reaction from readers. And I did get a lot of emails um, from, from people and they had to track down my email address and, and all that. And half of them were people who were really glad. They were like, I've been thinking this for a long time, but no one talks about this, right? Like this discourse doesn't really exist. And, and then the other half were like angry, angry pet owners who were saying exactly what you're saying, like, well, I'm a great pet owner. So my dog is happy. So what are you talking about? And we just have to think about how, you know, with the whole life cycle of a pet, right? So again, from the beginning, you know, what gives us the right to cause genetic you know, mutations, to, to cause real um, genetic harm to animals through this inbreeding to make them more, um, more, more doll-like. I mean, uh, uh, pedigreed uh, dogs have the same genetics as siblings, uh, the offspring of siblings. And that you know, everyone knows this causes huge health problems for, for these animals. And again, we talk about the loneliness, but also like how many animals are killed every year because they're abandoned at shelter, the shelters can't take any more pets. And it's, it's in the hundreds of thousands uh, in the US. I think it's close to a million animals are, are killed every year at shelters. I mean, it's, uh, it's terrible, let alone also how they're bred, where they're uh, in these puppy mills, where these, um, you know, the mothers are kept constantly pregnant and then they're discarded once they are, uh, are not able to keep up with production, basically. So I think the whole thing is, is really messed up, let alone the, all the damage animals cause to other animals. Again, if pets were a country in the United States, you know, if they counted the country for meat consumption, they consume more meat than Germany. I mean, they, they consume a huge amount of meat. And because people tell me like, okay, we have, people have pets, but that teaches them empathy, right? And maybe some people care more about animals because they have pets. It's a, it's a very small percentage of pet owners are vegetarian or vegan, right? It's only slightly higher than the rest of population. So, and only 1% of pet owners actually feed their animals uh, vegan food. And that includes many vegetarian or vegan pet owners. Mm. So I, I, I don't think this is actually you know, worth the cost. Well, you say that, you say... Blanketly or, or boldly, pet owners are not animal lovers. No, I don't think they are. I think, you know, again, I remember um, being with my mother one time and we were bird watching, and there were, it was an ecologically sensitive area, and there would be signs saying, like, leash your dogs, right? We would tell people, you know, leash your dog. And people would get really angry, actually, at us. You know, I think if you were an animal lover, you would care about what your pet could be doing to, to other animals, but also you would care about other animals in general. You wouldn't eat animals. You know, you wouldn't wear like uh, these coyote trim fur coats you know, that people wear while they have a dog right next to them. They wouldn't be supporting the destruction of wolves because wolves are eating cows or whatever it is. You know, I mentioned the piece that I think if people really like cats, right, they would care about wild cats, like endangered wild cats because uh, in Europe, for, you know, where I live, there are there is a native species of, of wild cat that's very similar to the house cat, and it's extremely rare, right? There's only like dozens of them in, in some countries, and, but there's millions of pet cats. So I, I, I don't see any uh, uh, transference of, of empathy from, from pet ownership. It doesn't teach us anything. You say it doesn't teach us anything, but it does serve a function and this is where like in the old days maybe or they still have working dogs dogs are animal companions pets have a function and their function is to be what a toy a doll you mentioned doll in your in your essay what is the function of the the pet as a doll and how does that that feed into our need to be a pet owner and why is that bad it's not good for the animal itself. I mean, it's being bred in certain ways to become cuter and all that, which causes, causes damage. Like, for example, the French bulldog is the most popular breed in the U.S. and, and many other countries now. Mm -hmm. And it's an extremely, you know, injured animal. It's, a, it's bred to be disabled, basically, because it's cute. And again, I was, as I was saying before, I think this like seeing the world through this lens of cuteness, right? This lens of like, what does this animal doing for me makes people um, 
have less patience for other relationships, right? So uh, I remember one time I was talking to a neighbor and she was saying, like, yeah, there's this raccoon and we have to get rid of this animal right? Like it's causing trouble and all that. I mean, like either the animal is like fully controlled by you and also is a, reflects you in some way, like some, someone that is giving you unconditional love, basically. That's what people want from pets. But the, the conditions for unconditional love is the complete domination of this animal, right? This animal has no other place to go. It's completely dependent on you for food. We begin a mess around with its genetics to change its personality and all that. And what gives us the right to do that? Because again, we 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 do not reciprocate by a, we have a completely dominus, dominated this animal. We, we do not give this animal anything in return. When people get tired of animals, and it happened quite a bit during the pandemic, people got their pandemic pets and they went back to work and then they got rid of their animals in huge numbers. People just dispose of it like, uh, like a toy, right? And I... I do not think this is this is just a yeah i think I think it's it's mistaking what the relationship that we could be having with the natural world, like this messy relationship uh with wild creatures that is unpredictable, as in like what's it like to live in a city that has let's say mountain lions or bears or you know or foxes or or wolves and nearby right and I think people are uncomfortable with this this relationship people want to have a very different connection to nature that is, is safe and predictable, but that's, that's not, not a good relationship. Or a fantasy maybe, but look, you mentioned a relationship based on, you know, the animals we would encounter who are free, but let's put it in an urban setting in New York. They just named a rat czar. Rats are part of the urban animal landscape of New York. And yet, People are are frightened by them. They uh, they freak out at the sight of you know rats. Now I know rats can be pets too. They're, aren't they better as pets than as wild rats in a place like New York? We say wild, but I mean they're feral rats in that case. Like there are you know it's hard to imagine, but they're you know it's kind of like you know, what's it like to see a raccoon in the forest? Like it's very different from a city raccoon. Like what's it like to see a, a rat in the wild where it's eating grass instead of garbage? I mean, like this is something that's even hard for us to, to comprehend. Uh, I mean, I think this is another example of this, 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 this idea that animals are disposable, right? So instead of New York actually fixing its sanitation problem, right? They're just going to try to wipe out the rat population with poison or whatever they're going to do. And this is bad for rats, obviously, and it's really unfair for rats. Not like, you know, who created the condition? Who created the conditions for this boom in the rat population? It was us, right? But we're not taking responsibility for that. And then all this rat poison is really bad for the rest of New York's environment, right? Like there are birds of prey, for instance, that will eat rats, and they will die because they're easy to eating poisoned rats. There actually was uh, a barred owl in New York the first time in many years. And it uh, died probably because it was eating too many, too many poison rats. So I think, you know, this, this is, uh, is another example of us seeing that animals are either good because uh, they're cute or then they they're can be destroyed. But either way, we have complete control over other, uh, other animals. So we're mired in this, as you point out, this $260 billion global pet thing. How do we get out of it? If, if it's so bad, how do we gradually emerge from this, this money pit and, and become free of, of this, this kind of pet thinking? I think we need to do it because there are also hundreds of millions of feral uh, cats and dogs that are destroying ecosystems around the world. I mean, uh, cats alone have caused the extinction of over a dozen animals. Uh, dogs are threatening uh, dozens of other species uh, with with extinction, and again, we're living during a, a period of uh, mass extinction. And, and it's it's almost stupid to say, but like pets are a cause of that, right? And in terms of what they eat uh, on their plate and what they eat outside, um, and then we should solve this. We should solve these problems together, right? And the way I see it. Is like what is the relationship we want to have with other animals? We want other animals to be free. We also want them to have enough space 
uh, for them to thrive. So this is why, you know, veganism is very important for my book on socialist planning, where it's, if you have uh, a fully vegan humanity, then we certainly have all the space for renewable energy infrastructure and for more nature parks. And that could actually stop the mass extinction because as uh, your you know, listeners know, meat production takes up a huge amount of land. And similarly, if we actually want to have a new relationship with animals, which is, should be part of this, this vision is that, uh, you know, we would phase out, uh, pet ownership as in you would spay and neuter pets as we have now. You would capture. Uh, feral animals, and then hopefully rear them as pets if you can. And th- there also would be a larger, you know, demand for these these feral animals instead of just killing them, uh, which is what a lot of environmentalists want to do by you know going out and actually taking out these feral cats and dogs and, and putting them in people's homes. You would, you know, within twenty years, you would not have any more cats and dogs. And then the the point is then cultivate these new ways of engaging with other animals, right? To encourage uh, amateur naturalism, to encourage, uh, um, you know, having rehabbing as a, a normal practice, to encourage you know, people to go bird watchers or get into lizards or, or insects or anything like that. And I think that would be, that's the end goal, right? To, to get rid of that domination of, of animals for, for meat or for our emotional support. But you really think that if we did, things that you just described step by step i i guess the biggest thing is spay and neutering right uh and then i i guess once your dog or cat expires not get another one unless it's a feral uh, cat or dog but you really think that in a essentially a generation 20 years we can be pet free there are a huge number of feral cats and dogs. Actually, most cats and dogs are, are feral. I think it's something like only one in five or one in four is actually owned by people and the rest of them are just roaming around. I think of all the challenges that we face, like dealing with this issue is not a not a big deal. Like as in like transforming the energy infrastructure that we have, that's a much harder thing than to say, maybe we shouldn't own pets. Uh, none of this is infeasible. I think it just takes a bigger, like a, a different mindset. And again, I think this is hard for you know lots of vegetarians and vegans to to talk about because I think they they really enjoy their their pet ownership, right? They really enjoy their pets, and they may become vegetarian because of that. But I think it's also realizing that we shouldn't the the domination is part of the problem. This like desire to dominate is part of the problem as well. That we should give that up too. So Troy, are I'm a pet owner. Am I a bad person? No. Not necessarily. I mean, I, I know that you must be a, a vegan and you probably feed your animal uh, vegan, a vegan diet. In the essay, I wrote that cats are a trickier problem. A friend corrected me and said that cats also can be better oh, vegan. Oh, because diet. they're yeah. carnivore, basically, right? Yeah. They're obligate carnivores, but we've much improved vegan substitutes. As I said, I think in, in the short term, uh, adopting shelter animals and feeding them a vegan diet, I I can't criticize that. But I think the goal, I mean, you also you can you can say to yourself like why why is that a good relationship to have with an animal, right? Like you know, let's say it's it, would you support the eventual abolition of the pet ownership, uh, or are you skeptical of it? Abolition of pet ownership, I I would be for that. I had my dog just like scratched me the other day. I'm, I wouldn't want to abolish her, but you know, I was pretty upset, but that's kind. Some people would say that's kind of extreme. I'm sure. Right. Yes. But I think, uh, of course it is. I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, holding my breath for this to happen. Right. But I think it's useful to think in impractical terms, be like, what is the society we want? What is the relationship with nature that we want, right? Let's be critical of everything, including the only thing that, I don't know, Republicans and Democrats agree on, which is like dogs are great or whatever it is. Let's, 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 be, let's be completely critical, right? And let's imagine uh, what's actually possible. And I think lots of people have been unsettled by the pet relationship, but again, I felt like there's no real language for it, no real discourse for it. This idea of having an animal just like wait on you all the time uh, to be a toy for you all the time. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange relationship. And it's also historically not a very old relationship. 
and we have to <laughs> imagine alternatives to it. Yeah. I, I mean, at least if you call for the abolition of pets, you're at least moving toward a more virtuous path in terms of one's relationship. That That's the, the, the main thing, right? To be true, truly empathetic, to be true animal lovers, you, your goal shouldn't be the domination of another animal. Yes. Yes. And I think we also have to, you know, combine our, the way we think about pets with these, with these other issues such as with uh, mass extinction, you know, with agri- agricultural use, with also, you know, mental health in our society of thinking, you know, why are people so sad <laughs> where they have to depend on animals to, to be happy? You know, how have we built our cities or structured our work week where people are lonely, right? I mean, we should be solving those problems as well. And I think if you raise this pet question, then suddenly you can see these, these other things as well. And also, again, for me, it's like, I just, you know, I've had pets before, you know, like I, I know what it's like to have a pet and we were not always good pet owners. You know, we had some lizards, one of them escaped, one of them died. You know, it's like, we were not, I think people are often careless and I don't, I don't think we were the only pet owners to accidentally, you know, like someone like they let their cat out accidentally gets hit by a car. You know, there's all this stupid stuff that pet owners do that harm their pets or their pets harm other animals. And this kind of carelessness that is accepted by society is ridiculous, right? I mean, we should not uh, have an animal, like another living being that we can basically uh, accidentally destroy them just because we're idiots. I mean, this, this is not a good, this is not a good relationship. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but if we take care of this, I mean, at least it's a positive thing. If you, start calling them companion animals versus pets, right? I mean, maybe that's I, I disagree, a actually. No? Oh, dark. No, I, I, I think Haraway, you know, this is my other, I have many unpopular opinions. I could tell you lots of <laughs> unpopular things. Um, Haraway has been a real step backwards for animal studies, right? I mean, Haraway eats animals, right? Like, do you want to really eat something by self, you know, in terms of environmental or animal studies? Uh, by someone who has not been critical enough to give up eating meat. I mean, it's it's ridiculous to me. And I think, uh, you know, she is reacting to um, Deleuze and Guattari, right, in their book, uh, A Thousand Plateaus. And there they talk about this idea of becoming animal, right? And becoming animal is this, uh, is empathy and this desire and this fascination with other animals, um, in the, in the book, they talk about, you know, it's not the best example. They talk about several examples. One I remember best is Ahab and the whale. Like Ahab is obsessed with this whale, but one could also, and other animal studies scholars have done this, have applied this to, to other figures. Like I got a bird watcher. The best book on bird watching is J.A. Baker's The Peregrine. And in The Peregrine, uh, Baker is so obsessed with these birds. He really wants, he wants to like flee his human skin and become a bird. That's really what, what that is. And I think, that you know that fascination and that that empathy is a much better relationship than whatever Haraway is doing, where she's. I mean, there's some weird stuff in that book. I don't know if you've read Her- it. Haraway, uh, for our listeners, uh, Haraway is. Haraway is uh, an STS, like science, uh, science and technology studies scholar who's been around for a long time. She's famous for writing the Cyborg uh, Manifesto. She talks about the Chuchu scene instead of the Anthropocene. And she's like a, a big figure in animal studies and, uh, um, um, and environmental studies. And then she wrote this book, uh, When the Species Meet and the Companion Species Manifesto. And there she's um, writing against, again, uh, Deleuze and Guattari, and then saying instead, that uh, companion species are uh, you know, it's a good relationship. Uh, and she talks about her own pet dog, um, uh, Cayenne. And then she also is interested in dog training and this thing, this idea of like, again, another t- a t- a version of like fully dominating an animal where you take a dog to a you know, competitive um, you know, set of uh, stances and you know, whatever they have to do for a, a dog show. 
And that relationship between the trainer, the dog, she's saying is actually a form of communication and it's so nice and all this. And I would say this is a form of domination, right? This is a, a who is deciding what happens at the dog show. I mean, only one person decides. So it would be okay if uh, every now and then the dog walks me versus me walking the dog. Yeah. And people say all this nonsense all the time. It's like, um, you know, parrots and their owners kind of thing, like, or like, and their, and their humans companions or whatever. It's not an equal relationship. It's as stupid as like the crap you hear about, um, you know, like, I don't think Michael Pollan or whoever says this kind of stuff where actually we co-evolved with other animals in terms of, like, you know, sheep or whatever. So when we raise them for slaughter, actually we, you know, they have like chosen to become domesticated. This is like such uh, ridiculous pseudoscience. It's such like a apologist nonsense to justify meat consumption. And we should not, you know, we should be critical scholars. We should not look at the pet relationship and be like, oh, wow, this is such a great thing. This is actually a really progressive, cool thing, this pet relationship. Like, no, like, this is an unequal relationship that's causing a lot of harm. And we can have many different relationships. And I would say going back to, to lose, right? Would actually be you know, and try to become animal, right? And that, that and pursue that as a goal. That would be much better. Let's lay out some steps for people who want to get out of their pet dependency and out of their addiction to pets. Uh, they should. What is a simple step that they can take? Um, because some people, if they get to this point in the podcast, they're just like. Uh, they're this uh, writing emails to me that I can forward to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm very but, mad right now. <laughs> or they're just saying, I'm a good pet owner. I, you know, I let, I let my dog sit in the kitchen and, you know, until, you know, let me watch me work all day. And then I walk her, walk her around for 10 minutes and then I go to bed and she goes to bed and what a happy yeah. life. You know, like Germany had to pass a law to say pet owners have to, they, they have a legal responsibility to walk their dog like an hour a day or whatever it was because people just weren't doing it yeah. right and uh, uh so i and i think in terms of like you know things people can do to make things better is to definitely oppose um you know puppy mills like they should not exist yeah right definitely. and there is a movement for that I, and when i wrote the piece you know the editor i was working with he's like we have to use um this new headline that you know, New York has banned puppy mills or whatever it is. I mean, this is good stuff, right? Like we should not do this. And we also should you know, push, uh, and we should not find it okay to have all these different breeds, right? To this normalized inbreeding. Uh, this is extremely bad for the animals and we should not think it's like a cute thing. I mean, for example, you can even go on a website that tells you, you know, what kind of aesthetics you have and what's your lifestyle and how big your apartment is and it'll tell you what breed to get and all that i mean this this is like you know it's like buying it's like going on amazon or something it's, it's totally ridiculous so we should be there is no real pushback against uh uh inbred animals you know these artisanal breeds but we should we should be doing that right and that the minimum people can do is again get a shelter animal and be vegan themselves and feed the animal vegan food and and talk to people who have pets and say like why aren't you doing that Right. Yeah. That's, that's the most basic thing. And obviously don't keep your dog on a leash or keep your cat indoors so they don't kill other animals. We're, we're equal though. Right. We're not dominating the, the animal. We're equal. We're present equally in this, in this world. You know, one individual can't do very much. Right? That's why I was saying like the goal is to, you know, ban eventually, uh, definitely ban uh, puppy mills, but also just ban commercial selling of animals and then uh to eventually get rid of the the animal uh like the pet population right that should be uh, that has to be the the end goal because again if you know, if you don't get a pet then well then some pet could have died in a in a shelter and that's yeah. you know is that much better no that's why we have to act collectively to change that i mean and fortunately you know these animals that exist are imprisoned by their domestication right right and we have to fix that mess, right? It's not going to be easy. And it's, there's no easy solution. Even like, you know, controlling the sexuality of an animal, right? To actually spay and neuter or whatever is very strange. You know, my mom has a pet parrot. That parrot is extremely horny, you know? Like it's, <laughs> is and it spayed? What, is it neutered? 
no, you can't, it's, you can't do that with the parrot, but uh, it's uh, what gives us the right, this poor animal is so deprived, right, of, of, her, of her sexuality, even, right, or even basic parrot-like things she wants to do, like she wants to build a net, you know, she can't do that. Again, like we should be critical of what we're, how we were depriving animals of, and what Marx would call their species being, like they want to do certain things as animals that we are depriving them of that. So again, we have to work together <laughs> to, I think, at least politicize this a little bit. I mean, there's like nothing on this, right? Um, and that's why I, I wrote this crazy thing for the Guardian was to uh, get a conversation going. Well, I think uh, it's but, I think it's worth talking about the abolition of pet ownership. That, that we have will, a lot on our plate. You know, we have to get rid of capitalism. We have to stop, you know, the environmental crisis, some mass extinction, and we have to do this. Like it's uh, it's a lot this, of messes. This is do. this is sort of the easy entree. This is the easy of all the things you mentioned. This. <laughs> That's why I get no. I get angry, and I preach my vegan stuff to socialists, and they'll get mad at me. And I was like, you can't just talk about climate change and say, well, it's easy to uh, change our energy systems. Like, that is hard, right? Getting rid, no eating soy or eating beans or whatever, that's easy. And if you're not talking about that first, that should be the first thing we do. We can do that, you know, tomorrow, right? Right. And if we're not talking, we should be talking about these. It's, it's more like the people like talking about the difficult things that will take decades to do because it's a form of procrastination. Like, oh yeah, I support uh, renewable energy or net zero or whatever. Will I do anything, you know, in the interim? <laughs> no. And I think it's the same thing with the pet issue, right? In some ways, it's a polarizing <laughs> world. That's the ultimate polarizer. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't mind having unpopular opinions. It's also interesting who comes out and agrees with you. You know, you never, you never know who uh, shares these opinions as well. So it's, I think it's just good to be unpopular and cause a fuss and be the annoying vegan. I don't. I don't apologize for that. George Bernard Shaw was the annoying vegan, right? And a socialist. And a so he was the annoy. He was the annoying man. Well, he he didn't say annoying man. He said the. Oh, I forget his phrase, but it was. Someone who was annoying, someone who was, who was disagreeable, someone who was. When someone says they like, be normal or why aren't you normal, then normality is what got us into this mess. <laughs> it's not, normal is not good. Troy Vitesi is a writer and postdoc from Canada. His new book is Half Earth Socialism. His controversial piece against pet ownership appeared in The Guardian this year. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. You can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or see my vlog at amok.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Or you can get the podcast on YouTube at Emil Amok One. That's YouTube at Emil Amok, E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K One. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can subscribe to as well as rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.